this Songs of Summer series, friends, we've been looking at the ways in which the music that we sing helps us to understand something about who God is and the ways in which God can use music to reach into us and help us to know who we are. And we've talked about that in a variety of different ways, what it means to come to know Jesus in our music, come to know what it means to know a Savior, what it means to know a little bit of hope and possibility. And this morning, we're going we're gonna to circle around a word that we use throughout the Vacation Bible School week, friendship. What does it mean to find a friend in Jesus, to find a friend in God? That's been uh, the work of Vacation Bible School this last week, and it's one of the songs of our faith and our story that we're going to come to in a moment's time. And rather than kind of trying to unpack each of the uh, sections of our our great work in Vacation Bible School, I I do want to remind you of them and share those before we jump into a, a story about Jesus as our friend. So on day one, we talked about this idea that God shows himself to Elijah through ups and through downs. That one of the ups of Elijah's story is that when he gets into a a kind of a prophet off with the prophets of Baal, he is able to call down the fire of God and they are not. That is a moment of great triumph and celebration for him. But it's immediately followed by him being threatened by Queen Jezebel and so he flees and sits down under a broom tree and asks God to take him. Says, "I'm, I'm not good enough. I'm not enough. And we're reminded that God shows himself to Elijah through ups and downs. It, it reinforced our theme for that day that God is a friend who's real. Oh, see, all of our VBS kids remembered, and now we get to teach it to you. That was a test, and you passed. Every time we heard our theme verse for the week, be it in skits, be it in teaching, be it in our classes, be it in our craft, we would take the opportunity to thank God, and we would do that by clapping our hands and saying, thanks, God. Try that on. Thanks, God. So when you hear a theme verse like day one that says God is a friend who's real, you say, thanks, God. Day two, God shows compassion on the people of Nineveh. This was from the story of Jonah, uh, and uh, you might remember him as the big whale guy or the big fish guy, Uh, but it's an opportunity to be reminded of a couple of things. One is that God wants Jonah to go to Nineveh to give them a message of judgment. God sends Jonah to the people of Nineveh to say, you're going to be destroyed. Jonah doesn't want to do that, so he goes the opposite way. Gets on a ship and sails away from Nineveh, and that's how he winds up up in the mouth of the whale. And as a part of that, Jonah apologizes to God in prayer and asks for forgiveness And God's compassion is poured out on Jonah. Jonah is sent back to Nineveh. He has the chance to deliver that message. But here's the trick in what we were paying attention to is that when Jonah goes back to Nineveh and says, God is going to destroy you, the Ninevites say, well, we don't want that to happen. We're sorry. We repent. We want to be kind to the poor, to feed the hungry, to give drink to the thirsty. We're going to live lives of substance. And we want to know God's love. And Jonah almost misses the opportunity. He almost blows it because Jonah's really mad that God would forgive the Ninevites. But God forgave Jonah, and God also forgives the people. Why? Because it was a reminder to us of day two's theme. God is a friend who loves. Thanks, God. Day three, we gathered, and we talked about a New Testament story, a Jesus who calms the storm The disciples and Jesus are out on a boat in Lake Galilee. Jesus is in the back sleeping, snoring gently in the way that Jesus does. The fifth and sixth graders said, does Jesus have sleep apnea? I was like, I don't know. I wasn't there. Maybe. (laughs) Not my place to judge. So he's in the back of the boat asleep and resting, and suddenly a storm comes up, and the waves are large, and it tosses that boat back and forth, and the disciples begin to panic, and 12 men's fear amplifies And they begin to nudge Jesus, and then they begin to kick Jesus and say, wake up, don't you care about us? We're going to die. And Jesus just kind of stretches, stands up in the back of the boat and says this, be calm. Now, the fifth and sixth graders, I said, did he say that to the storm or to the men? You take that home with you today, because I think the answer is yes. Because he challenges them with the, why is your faith so small? Did, 
do you think that God brought you guys and, and me out to the middle of this lake for our story to end right here in tragedy? Maybe there's more to what God has in store for us. And maybe we need to trust that we're going to be okay. And so it reminds us of our day three theme. God is a friend we can trust. Thanks, God. Day four, we gathered and we told the story of the resurrection. We talked about Jesus' atoning death for us, that there are things that keep us separate from God in our sinfulness and that there are need for us to come to God and that Jesus facilitates that, not just in his death, but in the power of his resurrection. That he points a way to eternal life that helps us to know that there are things in life that we no longer need to fear because God and Jesus are a part of our story. If Jesus is a friend to us, death is not the final answer, it's not the final word. So we talked about the resurrection story and what it meant for the disciples to see and meet a resurrected Jesus. And in our fifth and sixth grade class that I was the the Bible study facilitator for, we got into some great conversations, 20 minutes with one and 20 minutes with the other about this idea of eternity. What does that look like for you? What does that timing look like for you? Is it a series of 60 seconds that add up to minutes, to hours, to days, just on end in a row? Or is time with God something different? And so can your time with God be something different even now in your regular life? And so we talked about the resurrection. And it was a reminder that God's love for us and God's friendship doesn't end when the sun goes down. It's not a today thing. It's not just a tomorrow thing. It's a reminder of our day four theme that God is a friend forever. Thanks, God. And then our fifth and final day, we talked about Lydia, the seller of purple cloth. This is a New Testament story from the book of the Acts of the Apostles. Lydia uh, worked with upper-class citizens and made beautiful garments of a rare color in her day. And the thing about this story that we wanted to emphasize and that we struck is that God's going to put people in your life where you can share God's friendship and the love of God in a way and a time that you did not expect to. Because as the story reads in the book of Acts, Paul and his friends go down for a beach day. Same way you guys might go to Zuma or or any of the other beaches just to relax and unwind and escape the heat. It was the Sabbath, so they weren't preaching or teaching. They went down to the river's edge, and there they met women drawing water. Lydia was one of them, and Lydia wanted to know more about Jesus. Acts tells us that she worshiped God, but she had not come to know Jesus. And so as Paul's able to share, she is changed and transformed. She gets baptized. She has her whole house get baptized. And then she has Paul and his friends come back to her house for a time of fellowship. Did Paul go to the river to tell a story and to find a new friendship and faith? No. God provided that when the place that he least expected it. So Lydia reminds us of our day five theme, that God is a friend for everyone thanks God. Our theme was scuba, diving into friendship with God. And it was a powerful reminder for me, and I just want to talk about a couple of things that I learned that week before we jump into our scripture for the day. Three things. First is this, how we treat each other matters more than how we're seen. You saw these kids up here today in their awesome uh, dive team uh, VBS shirts. It reminds them of their classes uh, with the, that they're a part of or who their leaders are. There are a variety of colors, but in large part, you'll see in a clip later that we all kind of looked the same. It didn't matter where we came from, who we were, what we had back at our home. For three hours on a weekday morning, we had the chance to be the people of God gathered in this place singing God's songs and sharing God's love together. And as a part of that, what began to matter was how we treated one another. We saw these kids begin to offer compassion, strength, and encouragement when a friend skinned a knee, when they were scared, when grandma had to leave to go on with her day and you felt alone. It was a chance for these kids to love on one another and to show that how we treat each other matters. The second thing I learned is one of the things that this church already knows, it's one of our seven things, it's that God's love changes things. As we shared the story of God's love and a triumphant story of God coming to be a part of their life, these kids resonated with that. Their singing got louder. Their dancing got more vigorous. They would shout their praises to God because they knew, at least for a week, because of your generosity and your support, your donations and your prayers, that God loved them and they were worth it. And the third thing I learned is that our young people are passionate about being generous. I want to call your attention to the right side of the room there. 
Uh, we have a little uh, counter, uh, as well as some pictures of some young people from the Central American co uh, country of Honduras. Uh, there is uh, problems with access to clean drinking water in Honduras. And so what we did is we raised money during our VBS week to support the opportunity for young people like the kids in these pews all week to have access to clean water. We set a high goal for young kids. We said, we want to raise 500 bucks this week. And they were like, I think we can do it. I think we can do it. We set daily goals and there were things like popsicles and things that they could get as a part of celebrating their accomplishments. But as you see, as it bursts out the top, not only did they raise the $500 we set for them, but they raised almost 670 bucks just out of their generosity. You bet. And here's why it was a learning moment for me. Go back to that first point. It doesn't matter what we look like. It doesn't matter how we're seen. What matters is how we treat one another. I watch kids walk up just with handfuls of pennies and nickels to dump in the offering. Some kids had a dollar. Some people hit up grandpa for a $5 bill and they got to go up with a little bit more money. No matter what happened, it didn't matter what they had to bring. It's that they were a part of bringing who they were to make a difference in the world. That they take for granted the idea that they can turn on a tap in their kitchen or in their bathroom or put their cup into the face of a fridge and get water that is clean and healthy enough to drink. Whereas these kids live in a pattern where their moms or maybe even them have to go draw water from sources of water, has to be purified, boiled before it can be used for cooking, for cleaning, or even just for the basics of drinking. So in just in a pattern of generosity, we were able to share with more than 100 children the idea that, yes, you are special, yes, you are loved, yes, you are a friend of God, but you are also blessed to be a blessing for others. And that's the pattern of generosity. So would you share? And I'm so proud of the ways in which they shared with others. These were kids who learned about what it meant to be a friend of God and taught me the same. And so I want to take a look this morning at one of my favorite texts from the Gospel of John about the idea of what it means to be a friend to Jesus. It comes from the 15th chapter, and it highlights this diving into the friendship of God theme we've been dealing with. It's actually a commandment from Jesus to you all, and it reads in this way. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay one's life down for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's mind or business. Instead, I have called you friends, for everything that I have learned from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me. But I chose you, and I appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give. This is my command. Love each other. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So in the Songs of Summer series, as we've striven to try to see where God is present in our songs and our stories, I really like this idea that Jesus would remind us, that God would remind us through the person of Jesus, that we are called to be good friends to God in Jesus Christ. And what Jesus says that means is to do a little more. Because we're not servants anymore. Servants in Jesus' eyes are people who operate on a schedule, they do what's expected of them. They do as they're told, hopefully without asking. In the first service, I said, go and bring me a Diet Coke, and I put my hand out expecting one to appear, and it did not. I'm moderately disappointed, but we are friends. You are not my slaves. The slaves and the servants did as they were told without expectation. They operated on a schedule. No, Jesus says, you are not servants, you are friends. You don't just know the schedule of God, you know the heart of God and what is asked of you to do and to be a little bit more, to love a little bit deeper, to go a little bit deeper. You're not just servants, but you're going to be friends and partners to me. You can come to trust that I am with you, but more than that, you can learn to extend that pattern of trust to others and to not just be able to say, hey guys, Jesus is always with me, but be able to offer that same sense and say, friends, I am with you too, and so is my friend Jesus. We amplify that message of diving deep into the friendship of God if we take seriously the idea that Jesus calls us to love each other. It invites us to lift our eyes to see and our ears to hear the world in an entirely new and different way. 
Our theme throughout VBS has been diving into friendship with God. And so with the, the yellow submarine and these awesome signs and symbols of, of what's going on underneath the water, it is a reminder to us that there is such beauty, such power to the oceans that we are adjacent to. But as a symbol for God's love, the thing that I keep coming back to is it's not the stuff that we can see and appreciate and touch. For me, the depths of God's love is always that which I cannot see. Fifteen years ago, I had the chance to be the pastor in Malibu. And while I was doing triathlons there, I would open water swim off of Zumba Beach. And I'd swim out about 200 yards, so I'd get outside the breakwater where the waves are crashing. That's where the water's a little bit stiller. And then you can swim along the coast without getting tossed around quite so much. Now, when you swim out that far, here's what happens when you're swimming in the ocean. All you can see is your hands and you. Now, I could kind of dive down a little bit, but I wouldn't be able to see the bottom of the, wa- uh, uh, of the ocean there. It was too deep. I was out far enough where the depth of the ocean was such that I couldn't scoop it up with my hand. I'd, I'd have to go in closer to shore to do that. No, out where I was swimming, it was just me in the water. And I was moving through it. I could see my hands. I could hear my breath. I could continue to swim and trust that I was going to be safe. But boy, if there was ever a little piece of seaweed or friendly sea lion that came to check me out, those were moments of kind of terror because I couldn't see what was going on around me because the Pacific Ocean in Malibu is not that clear. Why do I say that? Because for me, the love of God is such that it doesn't just stop a foot in front of me, right? And go, oh, here's the love. This is enough for today. It has a depth to it that keeps going much farther than I can ever see or appreciate. I can't outlive it. I can't outlast it. I can't outdraw it. I can't outlove the love of God. So I should never be shy about sharing God's love with somebody else under the fear that God's love is not going to be deep enough for me. It always is deep enough for you. Songs of Summer. And when we've been talking about friendship with God throughout our time together, one of the hymns of our church that kept coming back to me again and again and again is, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. We're going to get the chance to sing that together in a little bit here uh, under the partnership of our band. Don't get up yet. I've got a little bit of preaching to do, but I'll let you know. What a Friend We Have in Jesus was written by this guy. He was a pastor in Canada. His name was Joseph Scriven. Joseph was born in Ireland but moved to Canada, and he lived there, and that's where he wrote this hymn and poem. It's likely that this is the most famous Canadian Christian hymn. So if you're keeping score at home, This one counts as that. Joseph's life was not daisies and happiness. He had some hard times. I find it hard to appreciate or even imagine in my story. uh, this, This next month, I celebrate 24 years of marriage with Camille. But Joseph's story is this. Not once, but twice in his life, he tragically lost a fiance to death. He'd been engaged, planned to be married, found someone he thought that he was going to give himself to and be in covenant with. And that woman passed away before they made it to the altar. He was a guy who dealt with grief, who dealt with struggle. But in the midst of his darkness, in the midst of his struggle, he wrote beautiful poems. This one that we sing as a song is one that he wrote to and for his beloved mother. Sent it back to her in Ireland. And it wasn't published as a hymn until after Joseph had passed away. But this poem, and that's his actual handwritten poem on the screen up there, he didn't call it What a Friend We Have in Jesus, even though that's the first line. He called it Pray Without Ceasing. For him, this is a poem and a song about prayer and how we live our life. The the verses that we'll sing are, are the more familiar. The first two, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, All Our Sins and Griefs to Bear. What a Privilege to Carry Everything to God in Prayer. The second verse starts with challenges. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. And it sings about this idea that Jesus is a friend to us that is going to help us in the high points in our life and in the low points in our life. When we have blessings to share and when we have grief that seems to be too much to let go of, Jesus is still a friend to us. 
The powerful thing is the stanzas of his poem that we don't often use in song. They don't work as well. The last one starts this way. Are we cold and unbelieving, cumbered with a load of cares? Oh, grace, still the Lord is still my refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. There are times in life where we might feel, as Joseph did, cold and unbelieving, but then and even then, Jesus is a friend to us. Why do I know that? Because God's love is deep. God's love is deep. It's not just what I can see. It's not just what I can touch. It's beyond my fingertips, and it's beyond that. I can't outdraw it. I can't outlove the love of God. What a friend we have in Jesus. As our band comes up, they're going to help us lead this classic uh, tune in a new way. But I'm going to lift up two questions for us to pray about and to think about as we consider the words of this song. The first is this. What do we do with our struggle? What do we do with our struggle? Because it's enough to be able to say, VBS was great, I had so much fun, it was fantastic, the world is butterflies and daisies, life is good, let me tell you about my friend Jesus. But what do we do when we struggle? What do we do when it's hard, when we're sick, when we're hurting, when someone we care about is dying or hurting? How do we live our lives in such a way that we allow the struggles to be a time where we take things to God in prayer, just the same as we do with our blessings and our high moments? What do we do with our struggles? The second one is like it, but it's more specific. What can we take to the Lord in prayer? And that's a trick question because the answer is, it all. Not just because Joseph says so, not just because it's the confession of our church and our faith, but out of that firm belief that there is a God who loves you enough and is God enough to receive you, to take your praise and thanksgiving when life has gone well and you're living out of abundance, and to amplify that. To take your life when it's kind of meh and average and meet you there. And to meet you at your lowest and your deepest struggles, at your most ill and at your most fragile, at your most sinful and at your most broken, and say, yes, I am still a friend there. What do we take to the Lord in prayer? Everything. Everything. That's the invitation of the song. Church, I want to invite you to join me in standing as we sing our faith together. We're going to sing the first two verses along with our band of What a Friend We Have in Jesus as we remember Joseph's poem.
gracious and ever-loving God, help us to see you as our friend and to be able to offer our vulnerability, our struggles, our every weakness to you in our lives, in our prayer, that we might be able to help carry the load for another friend to Jesus, for you love us so deeply, and we say to you, thanks God, amen. For God so loved the world that He gave us His one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in Him will live forever. Oh, the power of hell forever defeated. Now it is well. I'm walking in freedom for God so loved. Do we need people to 